Thank you very much. I will say salut now with my face. I might uh, turn off the video to, to preserve bandwidth. Uh, so, uh, hi, this is me, and now you'll, you'll hopefully just hear my voice. Um, okay, great. Um, so, uh, as, as he um said, I want to talk today uh, about um, the characteristic polynomials of the classical compact groups. Um, everything I'm going to be talking about today is uh, work with that's joint with uh, John Keating and Theo Asiotis. Um, some work we've been conducting over the past uh, sort of two or three years. Um, so it's a pleasure to speak to everyone today and uh, Happy New Year as well. Let's hope uh, this year is a bit better. So uh, yes, classical polynomial, so characteristic polynomials of the classical compact groups. So uh, which, which matrix groups uh, am I particularly focusing on? Um, well, so unitary, symplectic and orthogonal uh, matrices. And so I, I give the definitions here. Um, so we see at the top here, we have the unitary matrices. So uh, as we know, these are the invertible n by n uh, matrices with entries in, in C, uh, such that they, they obey this, this property that their conjugate transpose is the matrix inverse. Um, so this is always going to be the canonical, uh, canonical um, uh, matrix group that we're going to be thinking about. Um, and I want to emphasize now, because it will appear throughout my talk, that I will always write capital N for the matrix group, uh, so the matrix size. So there are two um, sort of uh, other uh, matrix groups that I'm interested in, which are the second and third that you see here on the slide, i.e. the symplectic and the special here even orthogonal matrices. So firstly symplectic, so the second line here, um, these are now even dimensional, the, the definition requires them to be even dimensional. These are unitary matrices uh, and they have the additional property that they uh, sort of preserve this capital omega matrix under conjugation in some sense. So this omega matrix, so I've written orange here, is this skew symmetric matrix uh, here, which is just block diagonal, uh, sorry, block anti-diagonal uh, identity, uh, and uh, block zero matrices. Again, the, the precise definitions of, of these groups isn't necessary uh, for the rest of the talk, but I want to sort of set out notation at the start. So then finally, uh, we come to the uh, orthogonal case. So classically, uh, the third candidate would be not what I've written here, but just the general orthogonal matrix group. But for a couple of reasons, I'll say a couple of words about it in a second. I want to focus some attention on, on this particular version, so this special even dimensional orthogonal matrices. So, so as written here, these are the invertible 2n by 2n matrices with real entries. They're orthogonal, as we see here, uh, and additionally, they have unit determinant. So uh, why special even dimensional matrices? Well, a couple of reasons. So, so firstly, it somewhat is, is easier for presentation. So just uh, we have cleaner results in, in this case. Secondly, the number theoretic implications that, that I'm interested in uh, are in some sense captured already by, by this particular case of orthogonal matrices. So, so uh, the even uh, dimensional special orthogonal matrices capture the number theoretic properties that I'm interested in, which is why we focus on that. But I'll emphasize that we, we don't necessarily have to stick to even dimensional special matrices. We can do other uh, more general orthogonal matrices. Uh, and uh, finally, what I want to say is that uh, these definitions I won't need sort of henceforth, but uh, some special properties of the matrices we will retain. So uh, I will write uh, capital G of N for, for any of these matrix groups, um, and that's what we're going to be considering now. OK, so uh, for any of these matrices, so unitary, symplectic or special orthogonal, uh, the characteristic polynomial is given by P and it has two arguments, A and theta. So clearly the characteristic polynomial will change depending on which matrix you pick and which point uh, we're going to be evaluating the polynomial. This, this subscript here will uh, denote which uh, matrix group I'm thinking about. But in any case, I'm always going to write the polynomial variable in this way. So, so the argument on, on the left hand side is actually the phase of the, of the polynomial variable, which is e to the minus i theta. And why do I choose e to the minus i theta? Well, I want to think about this as a function on the unit circle. And it's a functional unit circle because for any of the matrices uh, that I just uh, defined, their eigenvalues lie on the unit circle. So on the left hand side here, I've given you a sketch of 
for an example of a unitary matrix, the eigenvalues sort of have this repulsion property and they, they lie in the unit circle here. And similarly with special orthogonal or symplectic, here I'll give an example, for example, of uh, special orthogonal, uh, they again lie in the unit circle, but they have an additional property that they come in complex conjugate pairs. And that's why my G of N, my, my group, I use the argument N rather than in 2N. So obviously in the special orthogonal and symplectic cases, we're going to have two N eigenvalues, but they'll come in N uh, sort of individual pairs. So really N is going to parameterize that group. So that is the real key first thing we need to remember about these matrices, their eigenvalues lie in the unit circle. And the second key property uh, is that they are all compact Lie groups, so they have an associated Haar measure. So I can take averages of these polynomials. That's the other crucial fact we need. Okay, so uh, some motivation and background. So here in, and for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus attention on the unitary case. It's the sort of classical place to start, and it is the easiest version to present and often the easiest to work with. But everything I will say has can be reset and restated for the special orthogonal and symplectic matrices. So I'll emphasize that now, even though I will really just be talking about um, uh, unitary at the moment. So let's fix a theta. So I'm going to fix a point in a circle where I will evaluate my polynomial. And then a, a, a beautiful result of Keating and Snape that's 20 plus years old now uh, is the following. It calculates explicitly the moments of the characteristic polynomial. So if we take some complex beta that's required to have this property that the real part of it is greater than minus a half, and I'll explain why in a second, then they calculate exactly the moments of the characteristic polynomial, and that's what we see in the left hand side here. So this dA here is the Haar measure of the unitary group, so you can explicitly write that out in terms of the, the eigenangles, but here it is uh, sort of notationally uh, short. So uh, this is the two beta moment of the characteristic polynomial of a unitary matrix, and the closed form, like the finite n uh, the answer to these moments is the right hand side. So it's a polynomial, uh, sorry, it's a product, it's a polynomial, but uh, that was a punchline for a minute. So it's a product uh, of, of gamma functions, really, here. So the condition on beta is just to ensure integrability of the left hand side. Uh, but uh, we have a, a finite n formula for these moments, so clearly you can analyze them uh, as capital N goes to infinity, and we call capital N is always my matrix size. So as the matrix size goes to infinity, uh, this has an asymptotic form like this, so we have uh, a growth like n to the beta squared, and uh, a leading order coefficient, which is these uh, ratio of Barnes G functions, which I won't give the formal definition, they're, they're a generalization of, of the gamma function. So uh, here we explicitly can write the, the leading order coefficient and we have a, a growth like n to the beta squared, where beta is half my moment parameter. Okay. So some remarks. So uh, as I said, this is a, a exact formula. Uh, this first product formula here. You'll notice the right hand side, I, I fixed the point in the unit circle where I was evaluating my polynomial, but the right hand side actually, neither of these, uh, uh, these results have, have a theta dependence. They, they're agnostic to the value where in the unit circle you're evaluating. And this is all due to the fact that the Haar measure for the unitary case is rotation invariant. So uh, it really didn't matter. We could have just evaluated our polynomial, for example, at one. This is no longer true for uh, the symplectic or special orthogonal cases, which is one of the reasons why I want to focus on uh, the unitary case. But similar, you can uh, state results for symplectic and special orthogonal. So it's the quality that we see at the start it is proved by the Selberg integral. Um, and uh, when analyzing this, you can see when beta is an integer, uh, so you could uh, examine this, this product here when beta is an integer, and you can see that the moments of the characteristic polynomials are actually polynomials in N. Uh, and the leading order coefficient is C sub beta, which is this ratio of Barnes G functions, which when beta is an integer, specialized to just a, a product of factorials. And it turns out that the leading order coefficient this has um, implications number theoretically, this uh, leading order coefficient uh, 
has is, is an integer once you multiply it by beta square factorial. That's sort of evident from when you look at the C, so beta and beta is an integer. So uh, I might say a bit more about this at the end of the talk, I have time, um, but this final point really is sort of, uh, has the biggest consequences arguably uh, number theoretically. Okay. So this is a, a beautiful result. It's the moment of the characteristic polynomial determined by the Salberg integral. I want to quickly talk about two other derivations of this formula. So uh, the first derivation, uh, so an, alter, an alternative way of getting this result is via Toeplitz determinants. So uh, let's set out some notation. So we take uh, a real valued function, 2 pi periodic integral uh, uh, with Fourier coefficients uh, f hat of k. You can define the Toeplitz determinant. Uh, so Toeplitz determinant, if you've not seen this before, it, it's said to have symbol f, where f is this, this function um, that I've just defined. Uh, is that this following determinant is a determinant of matrix, uh, determinant of the matrix of these particular Fourier coefficients. So you can see it's got sort of constant diagonal, um, and otherwise you just take the, the relevant Fourier coefficients and then take the determinant, and that is a, a topless determinant. So how do you see the connection with uh, characteristic polynomials, averages of characteristic polynomials? Well, it's via the, the Heine identity. So the Heine identity gives you that the uh, so the Toeplitz determinant for a particular symbol is exactly equal to the average over the unit group of the product of this symbol evaluated uh, at theta j, so eigenphases. So if we make a judicious choice of symbol, we can actually recover our moments of a characteristic polynomial. It turns out here this g function is uh, the correct choice to, to take. And then the Toeplitz determinant, what we see in the middle here, for this particular symbol, uh, well, you can plug it in and via the high identity, which is this left-hand side equality, uh, that becomes our moments of characteristic polynomial. But you could just live in Toeplitz land and use uh, Toeplitz results, uh, in particular this result of Bessor, which is a generalization of the strong Zego uh, limit theorem which gives you asymptotically what this Toeplitz determinant behaves like, and it behaves exactly as we know we should expect, uh, but this is just using Toeplitz theory, uh, like this ratio of bar street functions times n to the beta squared. So that's one way of, of interpreting uh, the Keating and Snaith result, or actually rederiving it in the asymptotic form. This is not a closed form uh, derivation. Okay, so that was the first one. And secondly, uh, those who went to Dan's talk this morning uh, may, may be well versed in this, but let me set up uh, uh, this again in case you weren't. Uh, so symmetric function theory, uh, this is another way of seeing uh, these moments. So again, a little bit of notation. Um, uh, I'll, I'll read this definition out, but then I'll give an example because it's much more uh, clear through an example, I think. So if you take some integer, some natural number d, now, partition lambda of D is a sequence of non-increasing, non-negative integers with finitely many non-zero terms. And uh, it's a partition of D if the parts of lambda sum to D. So an example, I think this is much clearer. So if we choose the integer 14, then uh, a choice of partition is then, uh, so the many partitions of 14, uh, one of which is, is the one I've given here. So lambda equals 6422. Two. This is a non-increasing, non-negative sequence of integers uh, with finitely many non-zero terms, and 6 plus 4 plus 2 plus 2 is 14. You can draw a partition. This turns out to be very useful. This is called a Young diagram, and all it is is that boxes stacked on top of each other, where the first row of boxes is the first part of my partition. So six boxes, followed by four, followed by two, followed by two. That's a Young diagram of my partition. And the final definition for us here is a semi-standard Young tableau. All this is is a filling of these boxes. So I have some alphabet, and the alphabet typically I'll choose, well, I will choose, is the first n integers for some n. Uh, and we want to fill these boxes with these integers. And the semi-standard rules of filling the Young diagram are, are the following. So these numbers from this alphabet must weakly increase across the rows and strictly increase down the columns. So again, let's see an example. 
So here's a particular filling uh, of, of the partition I, I gave above. So this is the semi-standard Young tableau of the shape lambda 6422. And the alphabet I've chosen here is numbers one through six. And you'll see it across the rows were weakly increasing and down the columns were strictly increasing. So uh, the, there was some restriction on the alphabet depending on what partition you're using uh, because clearly in order to be strictly increasing down the columns our alphabet must have at least the number of integers uh, if we're using consecutive, consecutive integers uh, at least the number of integers uh, that are the number of rows okay so what does this have to do with moments of characteristic polynomials uh, if you haven't already guessed the punchline well, uh, it's through really the representation theory of the unitary group and through this theorem of bump and gambit. So uh, what I haven't defined formally, but what I'll, I'll briefly say is that uh, the irreducible characters uh, of the unitary group are, are Scher polynomials, which can be expressed in terms of these semi-standard Young tableau. And that allows Bump and Gambit, using this sort of complex representation theory, to express the moments of the characteristic polynomial uh, in terms of these uh, combinatorial semi-standard Young tableau counts. So in particular, for, for integer moments, uh, they, they calculate that the moments of the characteristic polynomial are exactly equal to this particular count. So let me move slides so I can give you the notation. So this count here is the count over t in s sub 2 beat of lambda, where this is the set of all semi-standard Young tableau of a particular shape, of a particular partition, partitions given here at the bottom of the theorem, with entries from the set 1 up to here 2 beta. So I'm allowed to fill my partition with the numbers from 1 to 2 beta. And this number of ways of doing that is actually exactly equal to my moments, my characteristic polynomial. The partition that I have to take is lambda, which is the second bullet point. We actually have a rectangular partition here, n columns by beta rows, and we're filling that, that grid with the numbers one to two beta. Again, using the sort of complex uh, representation theory uh, results, it's called a hook length formula. We actually can completely determine this combinatorial sum, and it turns out it's this product here. So lambda sub j uh, are the parts of my partition. And from this formula, you can really evidently see the claim I made earlier, which is that the, for integer beta, the moments of the characteristic polynomial are in are polynomials themselves in the matrix size n. You can sort of see that n coming out here. Um, and algebraic manipulations of this product formula can recover uh, fairly simply exactly the same closed formula that Keating and Snaith gave for integer beta. Okay, so that was the second derivation of the Keating and Snaith result. So uh, to conclude that sort of section of the talk, uh, what I presented there is three different ways of interpreting the moments to capture stick polynomials. One via the Keating and Snaith Selberg, uh, uh, Selberg integral result, one via topless determinants, and one via a symmetric function theory combinatorial uh, lens. Okay. So uh, moving on to more averages. So a generalization. I'm going to define now moments of moments. So uh, these are, you can see, moments of moments, M-O-N. And uh, whilst, so again, here and henceforth, I will I'll restrict to unitary, I will just emphasize here, this is for any of the classical groups I defined at the start. And now we're not just averaging over the matrix group, we now do a second average over the other argument in the characteristic polynomial. So that's what you can see here. So we have our characteristic polynomial raised to the power two beta as we saw before, but now we're doing two averages. The first is for a fixed matrix and we average around a circle. So that's this inner average here, but that is random with respect to the matrix we pick. So we could take the kth moment of that averaged over the relevant matrix group with the associated Haar measure. So this is a well-defined thing to, to do. So this is what we call a moment of moments. So a couple of remarks just to place it in context of what I've just said. So in the unity case, uh, so again, focus on the unity case, and we select k equals 1. Well, then we have uh, the following. So I've just subbed in k equals 1 in the, uh, the blue square equation above. 
Um, so all I've done here is exchanged uh, the order of integration, which is perfectly fine to do. And you can see that what you have on the inside of your integral here is exactly just the moments of the characteristic polynomial, which we know have no theta dependence. And so this is just the Keating and safe result. So for higher k, so for example for k equals 2, uh, it's no longer true that we're invariant under theta. So we, we don't have, we lose the rotation invariance. So this is a non-trivial thing, this non-trivial averaging to do for, for higher k, say. But for k equals 1, we have theta independence, and so our theta average is, is, is moot. Okay, that's the first remark. And the second remark is that if we are just focusing on integer k, i.e. This, this second moment here is just an integer moment, well then we can expand and again do all our int integral switching uh, and, and we get the, the line at the bottom of the slide here which says that uh, really what we're doing is we're taking sort of a k-point correlation function of my characteristic polynomial, this, this k-long product, averaging that over the, the relevant matrix group and subsequently averaging over where I'm evaluating uh, the characteristic polynomial. So that's another way of interpreting the moment of moments when we're looking at integer k. Okay, so uh, uh, an associated conjecture is the following, which is due to Fyodorov and Keating. So this is uh, I'm presenting for the unitary case now. So as our matrix size goes to infinity, uh, the moments of moments actually exhibit a phase transition. So in the first regime, when our moment parameters obey this, this restriction, we have some leading order coefficient, and maybe you can spot the ratio of Barnes G functions that we saw for Keating and Snape. Now we have a, an attached gamma, the ratio of gamma functions, and we get this leading order behavior like n to the k beta squared. In the second regime, when, when this, this behavior holds, we instead get some other leading order coefficient and some leading order behavior, which is, is different, like k squared beta squared minus k plus one. Okay. So uh, again, just to ground uh, what I've said at the start of this talk, for k equals one, I've said all along, this is like heating and snake. So uh, our moments of moments are unitary, one beta, i.e. k equals one, we know by Keaton Snape, this is asymptotically like the ratio of Barnes G functions times n to the beta squared. So there's no phase transition there. So we should see no difference of behavior. And actually, the, the, you can see we plug it into the conjecture, you get the same n to the beta squared behavior. There's no phase transition for B2, so for k equals one, but for higher k you do. Uh, so this, this tells you exactly what C1 beta is, but more generally, it's not at all clear what C k beta should be. So I'll spend a, a minute or so just sort of uh, emphasizing why this, this might be interesting. So um, as, I, as I remarked earlier, when k is an integer, you could do all your integral swapping and show that really what you're doing is doing a, an average of a product of characteristic polynomials around your matrix group, followed by a theta integral. So uh, what's happening there is you can associate this with, uh, with fischer hartwig uh, singularity. So uh, you can re-express uh, this again in the language of Toeplitz determinants, as I showed for k equals one. And then uh, what you you get is k fischer hartwig singularities. And in this first regime, that corresponds to the fischer hartwig singularities all being fixed and distinct. And so that's why this first regime, uh, the, the conjecture is so precise, but also it, you can essentially use Salberg to completely uh, determine this. So from that perspective, this first regime is, is handled. The second regime here is when you allow these singularities to merge, and so uh, that, uh, that accounts for, for the different behaviour, but also accounts for the, for the associated difficulty in actually determining and proving such a conjecture, because you get this merging of fischer hartwig singularities. So the second regime is, is the harder regime, is, is my claim. Okay. So with that all sort of set up, I'm going to pivot slightly and, and talk about a much easier model, uh, but one that has uh, actually is, is quite rich. So uh, uh, parking random matrix theory to one side, I want to, to now talk about a binary tree. So if we take a binary tree of depth n, so this is uh, not no longer my matrix size, this is little n, some other integer, and we're going to load to each branch in the tree 
uh, an IOD Gaussian centered with, with this particular variance here. And I'll explain in a minute why I choose this particular variance. So here's my tree. Uh, so this has uh, N levels, as I've written here on the side. Uh, we have two to the N leaves because I have N levels in my tree. Uh, this top uh, node here is called the root node, and to every branch of my tree I've attached a Gaussian. So if I stood at my root node and walked all the way down to a leaf, Hansel and Gretel collecting my Gaussians along the way, uh, I'd be picking up N different IOD Gaussians. And that's exactly what I want to do. So that is going to define for me my branching random walk. So I sit at the root and I go down to a particular leaf and along the way I collect these random variables. So these y sub m of l is actually these Gaussians that I just, I, I just defined earlier. These are IID which is important. Okay, so an interesting thing to do then is actually to look at the covariance. Uh, it turns out that that is part of the richness behind the, this simple model. So if we look at the covariance between two different walks, so I've identified, you see on the right hand side of my screen here, uh, two different leaves, I've, I've identified them, let's say, uh, and I look at the covariance between those two walks down to those leaves, well, this first line is just using the definition above, and the second line here is just noticing that the uh, walks that were exactly identical up until the point where my paths diverged. So they diverged at this LCA, the lowest common ancestor. Uh, that is what that is, and that is the node um, after which my paths split. So uh, my covariance actually is exactly my variance multiplied by sort of the level of my lowest common ancestor. So here this is n minus one uh, sigma squared. Um, even even more interestingly, if you think about placing this binary tree into a unit interval, so now these leaves, let's imagine, are, are equally spaced, sort of two to the minus n apart, then uh, e uh, equivalently you can say that the lowest com common ancestor, the level of the lowest common ancestor of these two leaves, is approximately given by the base two logarithm of the uh, one over the distance between my leaves. That's when I've placed it in this unit interval. And why is this interesting? Well, this is completely indicative of a log correlated process. And that's sort of what is underlying everything I'm talking about today. So uh, actually what, what this model is describing is a, is a log correlated process. Okay. But bringing it back to what I want to talk about, that is uh, the, the partition function associated to the, these branching walks. So uh, this partition function or equivalently moment generating function for the walks uh, is defined as the following. So this is uh, a sum over all the leaves. This is uh, fixing a tree and taking the exponential of here. The parameter is two beta for, for reasons that will become clear. Uh, but this is a definition of a partition function for, for the walk, uh, averaging over the leaves. And we could think about moments of the partition function. So this, this average here is now averaging over the, the Gaussians that, that are uh, attached to my branches. And so this is the moments of the partition function. And uh, slightly, uh, I'm giving the game away slightly here, but I'm going to call these moments of moments. Uh, sub little n. So, uh, well, why is that? Well, it is a moments of moments. I have a, a, a kth moment on the outside, so that's my Gaussian random variables. And on the inside here, I'm averaging over leaves. This is a moment uh, with respect to sort of the, the path down to the, which leaf. So, this is a moment of moments. Um, and so, you could calculate, for example, the, the first moment of moments in k. And this is a very simple calculation. This is just plugging in uh, k equals one into the above uh, definition. And what is x sub n of l? Well, it's just a Gaussian. So you can just use the moment generating function for a Gaussian, and it turns out uh, it's two to the n to the beta squared. So this isn't groundbreaking math here, but what is what you can notice is that uh, okay, a this is true for any beta. Any, any real beta. And also, okay, maybe this is a stretch to start with, but it matches the leading order of the of Keating and Snape. So remember that was the Barnes G functions multiplied by n to the beta squared. So if you identify two to the n, I, the number of leaves with the matrix size, this matches n to the beta squared. And so uh, we examine these branching random walk moment and moments and, and prove the following result. 
So uh, this actually, I think, published two days ago, so hot off the press. Uh, if you take two uh, integers, k and n, and some beta that's real but, but not zero, uh, then our branching walk moments of moments have this three different uh, transitions of behaviour. Uh, so again, I, I won't sort of focus your attention too closely just now, I'll, I'll make a comparison in a minute. So you don't need to care about what these leading order coefficients are at all, they're just positive uh, numbers depending on k and beta. And, and the exclusion of zero here is trivial, the beta equals zero case just means that the moments and moments are one. So we proved that these moments and moments are polynomials in two to the n, if beta is an integer, and they have these three different transitions. And so you might want to compare this to uh, the field of Keating conjecture that I presented uh, uh, about 10 minutes ago. Uh, and you should notice that if you again match up 2 to the n with capital N, the matrix size, you see that these uh, behaviours uh, match up. And this middle behaviour here, I'll say a few words about in a minute, uh, that is also completely uh, expected as well. So this branching model uh, exactly mimics the, the behaviour that's predicted in the uh, random matrix case as well. The leading order coefficients are different, but the, the asymptotic behaviour is the same. Okay, so that is sort of result one. And now I want to return to the field of Keating conjecture and sort of make a remark about uh, what is similar between these, these two models, the branching model and the, the unitary model. So recall that the, the, the unitary moments of moments back in random matrix world, they're, they're defined to be, to be this here. Uh, and all I've done in the second line is said that I could exponentiate the, the integrand here. So this is the exponential of two beta, the real part of the log of the characteristic polynomial. So why is that interesting? Well, uh, this inner integral here now takes the form of our partition function for the log of the absolute value of the characteristic polynomial. And you can show that the real part of the log is actually a log correlated process, exactly like I just argued that the branching random walk was a log correlated process. Also, the real part of the log of the characteristic polynomial is, is to a log correlated process. This is all explained where you, you see this matching of the behaviour. Um, and in this language, in this sort of statistical mechanics language the, of partition functions and, and temperature parameters and the like, uh, a natural thing to do, for example, is to define the free energy. So that is what this curly F here is, is here, which is defi defined to be minus one over beta, the log of this partition function. And then you can show it as the beta, beta tends to infinity of your of your free energy that's proportional. You can show this proportional to, to the maximum of the log of your characteristic polynomial, the real part of the log of the characteristic polynomial around the unit circle. And, and the right hand side of this proportion, it has been uh, studied uh, to, to great effect over the past five years. Uh, and there's a precise field of Keating conjecture for exactly what this should be based on this sort of free energy argument. Uh, and that's known now up to tightness by uh, Shaibri Madol and Naj Nudel uh, as well now. So there's been a great deal of work in understanding this right hand side too. Okay, so uh, that was one way of looking at the moments and moments. Another way of looking at them uh, is when k is an integer, because that is where we sort of get all this, this nice structure coming out. So uh, when k is an integer, all I've done here is I, I've done the, the, the standard switching of the integrals round, and now my integrand is now a, a product of characteristic polynomials evaluated at different points, k different points in the unit circle. So uh, some previous results, so as I've sort of said quite a few times now, when uh, k equals 1, we're just back in the uh, Keating and Snape case. When k equals 2 and beta is an integer, uh, there's a, you can determine exactly what this moments and moments is uh, for integer, uh, for k equals 2 and integer beta from the work of Keating, Rogers, Vullity, Gershon and Rudnick. Um, that's sort of that's based on on a, a comparison with symmetric function theory as well as a complex analytic approach as well. 
uh, independently and separately, Cleese and Kuzowski uh, use topless determinants. So um, this is all to do with the approach I mentioned earlier. This is all about these fisher hartwig singularities. When k equals two, you have two fisher hartwig singularities. And the important thing is here, we have get a uniform fisher hartwig uh, asymptotic uh, due to Cleese and Kuzowski, which is uniform when these, these singularities merge. Uh, so that was sort of a big breakthrough there. Um, and there's also a connection, I won't say anything more about this, but it's connection to, to Gaussian multiplicity chaos due to Webb and Nicholas Axman and Webb as well. So that's an interesting uh, sort of separate story, but I'll mention it here. Um, and just as in the, the K equals one case, um, progress sort of in all of these uh, all of these results I've just mentioned is really is due to looking at the matrix average. So you look at different alternative representations. We saw three for the K plus one case, the topic determinant, the symmetric function theory, and that the complex analytic cell work integral approach of this matrix average here. And that's really the, the, the crux of the matter. Okay, so uh, myself and uh, John Keating determined uh, what happens when both your moment parameters are integers. So when both your moment parameters are integers, certainly K beta squared is greater than one. And so we land ourselves in this arguably harder regime. Um, so in that case, what we showed is that the moments of moments are in fact polynomials in N of this degree, k squared beta squared minus k plus one, which is what is predicted by the Fjodorov and Keating conjecture. So it's better verify the Fjodorov and Keating conjecture for k and beta and N. And the proof of this result, you see is uh, two equivalent expressions for the matrix average. So uh, you do not have to absorb the, the writing I've just presented to you on the screen, um, but this is just to say that the, these, are, these equalities really are equalities, even though they, they look a bit bizarre. So these are the moments, moments in the middle here, and for integer k and beta, we show on the right hand side uh, a similar situation to in k equals one. This is a restricted count of uh, semi standard young tableau. And the left hand side, this, this ugly big integral here, uh, is, is a complex analytic sort of approach to understanding these moments of moments. So, by analyzing both left and right hand side, we're, we're able to prove uh, this, the theorem that is uh, stated at the top of the slide. Uh, so subsequently as well, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, FARS extended the, the analysis of Cleese and Kozowski. So uh, Cleese and Kozowski managed to, to handle two merging singularities and FARS, FARS does uh, K merging singularities. And so all this body of work together uh, shows that the Fjodorov and Keating conjecture is true for, for integer K. So, so it's a, a good combination of, of work. So uh, for the last couple of minutes of my talk, let me talk about sort of beyond unitary. Um, so I, uh, I said at the start, this is, you can express all of this um, for, for not just the unitary case, but also the symplectic and special orthogonal matrices as well. So this is the sort of general form of the moments and moments. And then uh, we showed uh, together with, um, Theo Asiotis and uh, John Keating, that again, we, we need moment parameters to be integer. Um, but if that's the case, then uh, the uh, symplectic and the special orthogonal moments are again polynomials. And they're polynomials, and you'll notice different degrees to each other, but also different degrees to the unitary case as well. And there's a, a separate uh, case for, um, for when uh, the special orthogonal case at k equals b to equals one. So it just turns out you have to do a separate analysis in that case. So the, uh, uh, yes, here we go. So this is the, the statement of the theorem. You could, you could prove this result using the multiple contour integral approach that I mentioned earlier. So when we had that really ugly integral on the left-hand side of the moments and moments, um, that uh, there is a, a, an equivalent way of stating that for symplectic and special orthogonal, and you could apply the, the analysis that we present in the unitary case to the special orthogonal and symplectic cases, uh, but uh, as you might expect, that's a bit of a headache. Um, you uh, separately, you could follow, for example, um, 
ideas from Fies and Krasowski and Fars. Uh, now, in these two cases, you don't just need Toplitz determinants, you need Toplitz plus Hankel determinants. Uh, but recent work of um, Cleese et al. Uh, gives you uh, the tools that probably uh, you need in order to do such an analysis. So it'd be interesting to see if we could recover uh, the results of this theorem using uh, the recent work of Cleese et al. Um, so you could uh, uh, similarly approach it via the Toplitz and Hankel route. Um, but here, what we use in, in this this um, this work is actually symmetric function theory. In particular, we use galvan zetlin patterns. So I won't explicitly uh, determine what galvan zetlin patterns is, but I'll, I'll give a sort of brief verbal overview. So. Uh, as in the unitary case, we showed that the moments of moments were exactly equal to a restricted count of semi-standard young tableau. And it turns out that you can uh, use there's a um, a bijection between uh, the Scher functions, which is sort of what's underpinning all of this representation theory um, analysis, bijection between those and, and uh, certain patterns, these lattice point counts, uh, which are these galvan zetlin patterns. And uh, you can re-express all of this in, in terms of these particular sort of lattice counts. Uh, and that's the, the route that we take. It's slightly sleeker and it's also a nice alternative view of, of, of how you look at these moments and moments sort of really in this combinatorial uh, fashion. So you can re-express these moments and moments in terms of uh, essentially the, um, the uh, a restricted galvan zetlin pattern with sort of, if you know what they are, you have some particular row constraints. And uh, for small K and beta, you can explicitly by hand even determine uh, the, these polynomials. And for higher K and beta, uh, what we have to do is we're actually using the galvan zetlin pattern that delivers you the asymptotic result. And we have to appeal to actually a different theory to get the polynomiality. Uh, of these moments of moments, but together they they deliver exactly that the moments of moments in the symplectic and the special orthogonal cases are polynomials of, of this degree here. Okay, so uh, what have I said? Well, so I've shown that uh, the version of the Fionnov and Keating conjecture is true for branching random walks. So uh, that's what I, I presented uh, earlier about these branching random walks. We have these three different behaviours. Actually, that reminds me, apologies for going back in the slides. I want to uh, emphasise something here. Uh, yes, here. So um, in the Cleese and Kozowski result, uh, as well as in the subsequent work by Fars that I've just, uh, I've already introduced now, uh, their result using these Toplitz determinants actually also determines the behaviour at this critical central point, this k beta squared equals one. And you get a behaviour like, uh, that grows like n log n. And if you recall, in the branching random walk case, uh, at the central point, exactly at this k beta squared equals one, we get a behavior like n to the n, which is equivalent to, to n log capital N, log capital N, if you make the uh, identification capital N equals two to the n. Apologies for the amount of n's that are floating around. So, uh, I'd like to revisit my conclusion slide. So, uh, Exactly, we showed that a version of the Fyodorov and Keating conjecture is true for branching random walks, including at this transition point. Uh, we, we get results that are consistent with the Toplitz analysis as well. Um, which um, what's particularly interesting about this is from one perspective, you, you see the connection with these log correlated processes. Um, but from another uh, perspective, you also, um, these branching random walks are, have been completely essential to the progress that I mentioned towards understanding the maximum of the log of the capturistic polynomial. So I mentioned that you can use these moments and moments, the free energy associated with the partition function, uh, to determine this is proportional to the maximum of the log of the characteristic polynomial. Um, and the order of the analysis that has been culminated in the work of uh, showing, uh, of the work of, sorry, of Shaibi, Madol, and Najnadal, um, that's all been intrinsic on identifying an approximate branching structure, sort of, uh, that's that's within the, the real part of the log of the characteristic polynomial. So this branching structure is, is what, the exact version of that approximate structure is what we're using in this top, uh, analysis here, so it's branching random walks. So for the first time we've connected in the moments and moments case, uh, branching random walks to um, the unitary analysis. 
in the second point here, so we, we use both a complex analytic approach and symmetric function theory sort of together, they, they produce uh, these uh, asymptotic results, which also give you the polynomiality result. And we have shown that the classical group moments and moments are actually polynomials for particular degrees. And we're also able to, to calculate, if you look at some of, uh, some of the papers, you'll see that we actually give um, the exact polynomials. We're able to, to, to determine for low K and beta these exact polynomials and there's some beautiful structure there. So I think there's some interesting research to still go on into understanding sort of closed form versions of these moments and moments polynomials. So in the unitary case, as I said, this, this proved a, a subcase of the Fyodor and Keating conjecture. Uh, as I mentioned, our results all have an underlying log correlated structure. And the moments of moments have, have interesting number theoretic uh, implications. So apologies if people wanted me to talk for, for most of the talk, or have happily done it, but I didn't have time to talk about uh, more number theoretic implications. But let me just say a couple of minutes on, on what this is. Well, there's a, and possibly in the next talk we'll say even more about this, um, but there's a, a now sort of, uh, well accepted view that that there's uh, and powerful evidence behind uh thinking that unitary polynomials in some senses model number theoretic functions in particular unitary characteristic polynomials model the riemann zeta function and so uh our moments of moments so, uh, let me let me backtrack slightly the keating and snape moments um have provided a, a really interesting um uh, and crucial, actually, uh, uh, leading order coefficient in, in, the, in the number theoretic case. So uh, uh, there was a mystery behind the leading order coefficient and the averages of the zeta function, which turns out, conjecturally, should be explained using the Keating and Snape van der matrix theory. And by generalizing this, our moments of moments uh, not only give an implication about what the leading order coefficient should be for moments of moments of number theoretic functions but actually also should predict exactly what they behave like for for large values of where you're averaging so these moments and moments as well we we formulate conjectures about what their number theoretic implications are too but i think that's all i have time to say and that uh, that is my time so thank you very much i'll invite questions Thank you, thank you, Emma. Uh, so everyone uh, may unmute themselves, uh, and if you want, uh, thank uh, applause, uh, Emma, with me. And if you have questions, uh, you, you can ask them directly, or, or also in the chat, and one of the organizers will ask the question. I do have a question, if I'm permitted. Uh, so it's, it's not so much a question, but a remark, and I haven't thought this through. But I suspect that if you put, take the union of my slides from this morning and your slides from now, there is even a fourth formula for these moments of moments as observables of uh, sure measures. OK, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, you get immediately a fifth formula, which are fret home determinants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, of course, right. triplets equals Fred Holm due to Bogodino Kunko, so this was this is not that surprising. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe we should talk about this because I haven't had time to actually uh, think through the computation. But uh, this morning I was speaking about exactly these averages that you're talking about before you're integrating over the thetas. Mm -hmm. so integrating over the thetas would just mean integrating in the corresponding observable of sure measures. Exactly. Or, or, you, you you'll be integrating over the variables i think I, I i have to sit down and this might actually give you might even give you closed for, uh, form formulas or something uh, yeah we should talk about this if you have time it's yeah, uh, closed form formula would be fantastic even another interpretation of the leading order coefficient would be really interesting so yeah no, that sounds great the reason I'm saying this is because there's a paper of Okada from about 25 years ago where he gets sums of sure functions, orthogonal functions, or symplectic functions, restricted sums that look like uh, observables in sure measures, equal one single sure function of the form of rectangular form, or maybe orthogonal function, or maybe, or maybe symplectic function. Otherwise said the number of orthogonal, symplectic, or semi-standard Young tableau. 
not so great. This, this is all. This goes back to Okada and probably even older, to to, to the eighties. But uh, in any case, uh, I would have to sit down. So so maybe we can talk. I don't want to take the time for the question, but that'd be great. I suspect something a little bit more could be said. I hope at least. Great, thank you. I, I have a question. Um, so, if you, if, if the if the characteristic polynomial at the point uh, theta i, you you take the modulus and raise it to a, a power two beta i, which may vary for each theta i. Um, mm -hmm. Is, is, would it be interesting to do that? And uh, do you think it's possible uh, that part of your approach would work for that? Or, or yeah, maybe it's not no, interesting so at all? I, I'm sure it'd be interesting. I think you wouldn't, you would no longer get, for example, in the symmetric function theory case, you probably no longer get rectangular tableau, you get tableau of different shapes if your beta i were, were non, non unique, so non, non uniform. In the um, complex analysis you you could the formally that we use are more general than, than our interpretation so they allow for different um different exponents as well so uh, i should imagine that that you could definitely change the the parameters there so that yeah that is a natural generalization of what we do and would that have also uh, some some analog in the on, on the number theory side yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So there's uh, there's analogs of the conjectures that also allow for different um, different uh, exponents. It's just in the number theory land, everything is so difficult that that will, even just getting sort of uniform uh, parameters uh, is is a challenge. But absolutely, it would automatically have uh, consequences number theoretically. <laughs> 